So it's, um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you today, tonight. Um, uh, just a quick announcement. In March, do, do, do you have the date set? I think it's, um, um, it's the last Wednesday. I think last in Wednesday in March. Yeah. We will have a talk uh, by Chris Godfrey on uh, behavioral finance. We haven't had any behavioral finance talks yet, um, so that will be um, the first one this year. We also have another interesting announcement to make. It's that we're opening a second venue in London in the city. It's going to be the City University Club, right uh, next to Bank Station, right in the middle of the city, close to Royal Exchange. And we'll continue the event series here and start using uh, the venue in the city as well. And we'll inaugurate the venue on the 9th of March. Chances are the talks will be starting a little bit earlier there, probably 6.30. I'm not actually sure just yet. We'll put an announcement up. Um, and our very first speaker will be uh, Ian Clark, who many of you know, and he'll be talking about um, FX options, I believe. Um, but it's, it's a very, very interesting venue. It's, it's, a, it's an old uh, university club, very traditional. Um, and uh, it, the, with very strong connections to, to Oxford and Cambridge universities. And, uh, we, and despite the fact that it's very, very traditional and typically requires uh, a very strict dress code, um, uh, we have managed to negotiate that away. We'll have the venue to ourselves, um, and uh, that, that will start on the 9th of March. And the hosts, our, our hosts will welcome you with a free glass of champagne, and hopefully there will be more um, um, pleasantries from them on the evening. So more information on that, that's 9th of March. Um, and the next talk in Canary Wharf uh, will also be will be the Wednesday yeah, in March. Last Wednesday. Last Wednesday in March. Um, now, the speaker tonight needs no introduction because it's our co-founder and uh, also founder of Q Macro, Saeed Abbott. And Saeed has done uh, by now probably the most work in the world on FX strategy. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, well, we, we kind of, I would, I would value <coughs> that. And also on um, very, very, very original work in effect strategy using uh, new information, using uh, new method methodologies, machine learning, and new technologies. And today he will talk to us um, about how best to harness Python to create and fine-tune your trading strategies. Please welcome Said. So, thanks, thanks for that kind of introduction. It's probably, probably too kind. Uh, so yeah, as, as Paul mentioned, I'm going to talk about using uh, Python in financial markets. The question I have is, just to show fans, who here uses Python? OK. OK, that's good. So I'm preaching to the converter there, I guess. So. <laughs> that also means that some of the talk you probably already know. So please bear with me um, on that as well. Um, so this is a bit about me, just kind of rejigging what uh, Paul was saying. Um, so basically, that I've established Q Macro. I'm also the, the co-founder of Talesians. Uh, and I worked uh, at Lehman Brothers and also in the more with, with Paul as well. Uh, I've also written a book, Trading Talesians. And I presented my research at the Federal Reserve Board and also the Bank of England. Uh, and another, another bit of news, I'm also planning to write a Python book as well. <laughs> I don't know when I'm going to start it, but I hope I'm going to start it soon. So some of the stuff that's in this talk will end up being in the book. So you're getting a sneak, sneak preview. Um, I guess to some extent, I don't need to tell you this, but I just want to give you a brief overview of why should you use Python to analyze markets. In a sense, there's two conflicting objectives. So one is that you want very fast computation. And the others, you want fast development time. So it depends upon which one you want to prioritize. So the idea is that fast doesn't necessarily just refer to computation. Also, it refers to how long it takes you to implement strategies as well. So obviously, if you're using C++, that's, that's going to be very fast. Java, to some extent, as well. 
how in terms of the lead time to develop uh, code in C++, it takes longer. Uh, less so, I would say, in Java. Um, but if you want to do something very, very high frequency, that's kind of the path that you'll, you'll adopt. Um, if you want to do something a bit more lower frequency, maybe intraday or daily, you've got lots of other choices. So R is a great language for cutting edge statistics, but at the same time, it's quite slow and it isn't really suited to large systems. Uh, Julia is, is very fast. Uh, I've not used it too much, um, but one issue is it doesn't have many supporting libraries. But I would, I would address your question on Julia. I would say that's true, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you'll probably disagree with that. But you would disagree. But I, I have to say, I have installed Julia. I, I did briefly start to look at it, and I think probably in the coming years I'll end up using it more. Julia Computing are actually marketing a product called Julia Thin, which is targeted at finance. Is that out? It's, it's relatively young. Yeah, is it open source? No, it's not. It's so, okay, that's the which thing. I'm so. bit, which I'm anti. But. Yeah. Um, not really a question. Can I ask a standing gentleman? Sit down so I can see this. <laughs> Me? If you don't mind, yes. I have to be recording though. Uh, oh, maybe not. Right. Um, maybe it's I can move. Maybe away. if you sit down there. Where, where the um, I mean, it's it's blocking the screen as well, so it's not ideal. The camera is. Uh, well, you sound. Like All right. Well, I think that we, we this time round, I think it's actually fixed, so it should be fine. Okay. Well, I'm moving the camera. You know, I I will try not to move. Don't worry. I'll try and stay within stay within the frame. Um, so. So okay, maybe 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 we'll disagree about Julia, <laughs> but I, I definitely think it's it's worth looking sure. at, and it's something that I would like to look at. Sure. Also, you can look at Q, um, and it can be used to backtest trading strategies within KDB. I've got to admit, I've not done any KDB. Paul is the Paul is the man for KDB. He's actually doing a book. He's there. also writing a very very good book on that. Yes, I was going to say the book as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and his book is going to be amazing. Yeah, and it, his book is supposed <laughs> to be amazing. So, uh, but. It is probably more difficult to learn than Python, and also KDB is not open source. But I think they have, is it for non-commercial use of 32 bits? Yes. Okay, yeah. so, uh, but the 64 bit is definitely is, is paid for. Um, so in a sense, you can think of Python as a compromise between all these different objectives. So it's a general purpose language, unlike R. It's quicker than R, but at the same time, it's not as fast as, as Java and C++. But at the same time, you can use it to engineer large <coughs> systems, so it supports object-oriented uh, the object oriented paradigm and there's a lot of libraries available which I'll discuss a few of them that you can use to play around with data and if there are specific bottlenecks you can use Cython to speed them up in Python um, and also I'll be showing you how to uh, call uh, Java uh, from Python as well uh, which I don't think many people do but it's actually quite easy to do so I'll give a demo of that so there's another way you can you can speed up your code and also you could argue that computation is getting uh, cheaper every time so Sometimes it's better just to buy more cores on AWS rather than spend, spending ages optimizing it. So that's another thing that you could argue. Um, so we start basically by discussing some of the libraries that you have for Python. These ones I'm sure everyone's probably heard of. So you have IPython, which is an interactive console for Python. Now it's called, called Jupyter Notebook. NumPy, which is the uh, base of, I'd say, doing matrix algebra. Just to show our fans, who calls it NumPy and who calls it NumPy? <laughs> NumPy, NumPy, you're NumPy. Okay, because I I never know whether to say NumPy or NumPy, or <coughs> so that's okay. I, I'm I'm in the, in the right crowd then. Um, then you've got pandas, which is obviously a time series library, and this grew out of the work by Wes McKinney um, at, um, at AQR, and this provides a lot of common operations for time series, like just simple stuff that you really need, like aligning, joining, and things like that. Then SciPy has operations for numerical analysis and optimization. And then SymPy for symbolic mathematical operations. One issue is that whenever you Google stuff on pandas, you tend to find stuff about this, <laughs> as opposed to the time series library. So it's just something to, to, to bear in mind. So not everything on their web about pandas is about Python pandas. Um, then if we think about visualization libraries, so one important part of data is actually visualizing. So you have Bokeh, which is a JavaScript-based library. So you basically can, you can create um, web pages with uh, visualization, and that's by continuum, continuum analytics, so <coughs> distributors of the Anaconda distribution. Uh, Matplotlib is the most mature, most well-known of the Python visualization libraries. Um, it's a very flexible library, but sometimes can seem a bit complex. You also have Seaborn, which actually sits on top of that, simplifying it as well, which is worth a look. Uh, then another implementation for visualization is Plotly. Again, this is a JavaScript-based library. Um, and the thing with this is you can also share charts on the web, uh, or in a private environment as well, or you can use it offline as well. 
Um, and it's accessible for many different languages as well. So uh, from R, from MATLAB, I think for Java as well, there's many different uh, adapters for it. Um, then you have VisPy, which I don't think is as well known. It's a bit of a younger library. And this gives you a GPU accelerated plotting. And I'll actually give you a demo of that later. So it's, it doesn't have as many features, I'd say, for 2D plots. But if you want to start doing animations or things like that, it's, it's actually quite powerful. Um, so then we have machine learning and stats. So there, there's PyMC3, which is a library on probabilistic programming in Python. Scikit-learn, which is probably the most popular library for machine learning. Um, and there's lots of uh, literature out on the web. TensorFlow is a new library which has been open sourced by Google. And something a bit different, if you want to do econometrics, is Quant uh, Econ. Uh, Paul's also building a library uh, for stochastic filtering in Python as well. So that's definitely worth a look. And I know he's, he's going to be releasing that very soon, um, if you're interested in, in that type of thing. Then we look at looking at kind of unstructured data in terms of text. So the nice thing with Python is very nice for dealing with, with text. So kind of the most well-known of the, the natural language libraries is NLTK. It's the most mature of them. Um, there's also uh, Spacey. This is a much newer library. So this is for extracting entities in text. So for example, if you have a newspaper article and you want to identify certain people or certain companies or things like that, Spacey is, is the kind of a cutting edge library to do that. Uh, and then as part of that, often you want to extract text from web pages. So one way to do that is using beautiful soup, because often if you, if you just <coughs> raw, uh, parse a web page in raw, you have a lot of tags and stuff which is not really, interest, not, not really interesting from a language perspective. You just want to get the actual text. So beautiful soup is quite nice for that. But I would still say that it, it can require a bit of manual work to kind of parse web pages uh, using beautiful soup. But it's a lot better than trying to parse it using regular expressions yourself, which is very painful. Then if we think about uh, front-end, so often when you want to do data analysis, you want to provide a front-end for people to actually point and click. So Flask is, is the easiest way to provide a simple web front-end for Python code. Uh, there's also Django as well. I've never used Django, but it's a lot more heavyweight. But Flask, you can create a, a web-based instance of Python really quite easily with a few lines of code. Uh, and really, really nice library that I like using uh, is Excel Wing. So, this uses Excel as a front-end for Python-based computation. And it's really easy, basically, to, to, to activate <coughs> Python through Excel wings. And that's a nice way if you want to distribute your code to other people as well. And also for, for testing purposes as well, it's actually quite nice to test code. Is, is that the thing they sell as basically a replacement for VBA? Um, I don't know whether it's sold as that, but I would argue that it can replace a lot of the, the things that you use in VBA um, by using that. Um, there's also, um, I think, Pixel as well, which is not open source, which I think uh, Nthought create. But I found Excel Wings a bit easier to use, but, but Pixel might be quicker <coughs> in terms of computation. Um, then, in terms of if you want to try and extract data from the web, uh, Selenium is quite nice. So that can let, let you simulate websites, basically. Um, so if you want to like point and click on a website, you can automate it through that. Um, if you want to do web scraping, basically to, to build up an unstructured database, uh, Scrapey is quite good for that. I haven't used that, so I can't tell you whether it's easy to use or not, but I know a lot of people have used that. Uh, Twice is pretty easy to use, and there you can, you can basically create a wrapper for, um, uh, for, for, uh, for, for Twitter. Um, there's also another, there's a other few nice libraries as well for Twitter for using the fee for the actual the fee that you actually pay for. Um, I can't remember the name, <laughs> but basically it's online or GitHub, something, Doctor something. And that's, it's, it's probably not a very good descriptor, but if you ask me, I will look it up. And basically that's if you want to have access to the actual fee that you, you pay for. So you wouldn't use Python to get access to the, to the full fee. That's only to get access to the, the, the free fee. Is it tweet I think. Uh, I, I can't remember. I think it's something like the, the GitHub name of the guy is called Dr. Skippy. I think that's it. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So um, another important part of data is obviously accessing the data. And as part of that, you need to store your database, your data in databases, and also you need to access market data as well. So Arctic is a, is a really nice library that AHL have open source. So it provides a front end for storing pandas, data frames, and MongoDB. And very, very simply, what, what it does, it, it compresses them a lot and sends them to MongoDB. Um, 
So you end up basically reducing the, the bandwidth needed over a network to use it. Um, and it also makes it pretty easy to store data frames in, in, uh, in MongoDB. You don't need to do any con conversion, it just does it itself. Uh, if you use Bloomberg, uh, there's a BLP API, which is their open source API for accessing market data. Um, it's, I have to say it's not the easiest API to use, but I've written a wrapper on top of it to make it a lot easier to use. Um, so I would just advise just using whatever I've done rather than going to the low level version of library. Um, if you want to access MongoDB in another way, uh, you can use PyMongo. And actually, Arctic uses it itself. So if you want to access it directly, you can use PyMongo. Uh, Quandor is an open source market data provider. So they offer free data and also premium data sets. And their API is pretty easy to use. Um, if you want to access KDB uh, uh, from Python, you can use QPython as a wrapper. I've not, I've not used it, I've got from that. Um, then if you want to use Redis, um, it was an in-memory database, and I'll show you a bit about that later. There's a, there's a library on Python to use that. And lastly, there's BLOSC, which is a, a, a very high-speed uh, compression library. And this is quite useful when you want to uh, convert your data frames into message pack, which is a type of, it's kind of similar to JSON, basically, but a, 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 a less dense representation. Um, so Are you going to make these slides available? Uh, yeah, if you ask them, if you send me an email, I'll... I'll Send, send you them. So, um, so if we think of like data science in general, we can think of a lot of parallels between data science problems and <coughs> developing trading strategies. So in a sense, we here we want to outline the generic steps we might undertake when trying to solve a data science problem. Um, and similarly, or if we're trying to develop a trading strategy. So the first step is finding a hypothesis. So let's say it could be that I think every Monday it's sunny. Obviously this is not true, but it <laughs> could be a hypothesis. Uh, and in a trading strategy, you'd have a similar hypothesis. You'd have some sort of rationale as to why, why you, you, uh, you trade in such a way. Um, so it could be that, say, there's a relationship between interest rates and FX. And I want to utilize that to, to trade FX. Um, the second step is you want to find data. So typically, this is going to be market data. But it might be actually a lot of alternative data sources. I've done a lot of work on using news data, for example. Um, and then this, this data, you, you need to collect that. Then the step three is you have your hypothesis and you've got your data. So we want to do some sort of uh, statistical uh, validation to check our hypothesis, uh, hypothesis. So in the context of a trading strategy, this would involve just doing a, a bank test as, as an example. Um, and maybe looking at robustness of our trading strategy as well around parameters and that type of thing. Also, is it realistic, our assumptions as well, for example, around transaction costs? There, there's lots of things that we might want to check. Uh, and then step four is presenting our findings, and this will often be with an element of visualization. So I like numbers, but at the same time, I probably prefer to look at a chart rather than a table of numbers. I think most other people are similar. So it's, uh, it's kind of nice to look at visualization as opposed to lots of numbers uh, clumped together. So what I've done is I've, I've built a few Python libraries. I started creating uh, PyTelesians over two years ago. And end up being quite a big library. So what I end up doing is I rewrote it and split it into a lot of smaller libraries. Um, and what you tend to notice is with open source, the, the libraries tend to be very focused on one specific thing as opposed to trying to do everything. So I try to do the same thing with, with the libraries that I've... So are these on GitHub? These, these are on GitHub. There, yeah, there are some things which are closed source that I'm going to show you. But I'd say 90% of it is on, was on GitHub, basically. Um, so you have... Fin market buy, so that's for backtesting trading strategies. And then Fin data buy, that's for accessing market data uh, from many different data sources, including Bloomberg, which is the one that I use most. Then chart buy is an easy to call chart library and has for multiple backends, so including Plotly, Bokeh, uh, and the like. Um, so I guess the key point is, and this is it's not really news to, to be telling, telling you this, abstraction is the key. So there's lots of choices of which underlying backend libraries we want to use. So if in terms of market data, which libraries do you want to use? Do you want to use Bloomberg, Quandle? Which visualization libraries do you want to use? Bokeh, Plotly, Matplotlib. Plotlib. So what I've done is, and I'm sure if anyone else has designed similar libraries, they, they would try and do something similar, is I just try and abstract away the underlying libraries that I'm using. So our code is not going to end up being messy. So I can. When I do my backtesting, I can concentrate on creating the signal and not worrying about how to access the data or visualization or stuff like that. Essentially, we want to separate out the plumbing, the data bits and pieces, 
from the underlying data science problem, which is how to generate a signal for, for trading. So traders can concentrate on developing a trading strategy rather than having to learn the APIs for Bloomberg, Reuters, Bokeh, Plotly, and the like. Um, and it makes it easier for codes to be maintainable and updatable, and also we, it's easier to add uh, underlying libraries when they become available. Obviously, this is not something which is groundbreaking. This is a very common, common approach. Uh, but I think often I try and adhere to this, but then find actually I don't. <laughs> I try to be as strict as possible to adhere to this. Um, the question when you do back testing is do you want it event driven or not? So the nice thing with event driven code is that you can end up executing it in practice and basically replaying the strategy using historical data or live. Um, and the issue with this <coughs> in Python is that you would end up having a lot of loops. You can use Siphon to speed this up, um, but it ends up being a more, lot more difficult. So if you want to do that approach, I would say, why not just do it in Java to begin with, if you want to use an event-driven approach. Um, and my main approach in fin MarketFi is I want to use it as a research environment, not as some sort of high-frequency trading platform. And that's one of the reasons I use Python, for, for example, as well. Um, so I've tried to basically cater to, to work that I do for myself and for clients, basically doing research or strategy rather than execution. That being said, if you're doing daily trading, you could probably add something into it for automatic execution. Um, but um, it's not something that's, that's present yet. Um, I might end up adding some event-driven code later, but it's not like the main priority at this stage. So I guess the main point of, um, of the demos of, of today is to actually do a few demos. And I'm also going to do some live coding. I'm pretty sure that it's not going to compile immediately. It's not going to compile immediately. So just bear with me. So the first step that I'd like to do is just to give you an illustration of how we download data from the from uh, using FinDataFind. And this is pretty simple stuff. I'm not claiming it's groundbreaking or anything like that. Um, so the first step that we want to do is we want to get we want to get a market data generator object. So I've, I've got my own version, which this is not open source, called cached one, because this can also go to database. But the open source one is just without the cached. Um, so the difference is the open source one will just go out every time to collect data. Okay. And then once we have that, we also want to download, um, we also want to create, get a market object. So the market object, you, from the market object, you give it a market data request. And then it will basically go away and, and call the underlying market data generator to give you a data frame. So the first step is let's, let's create our market data request. So let's say we want start data for, from 2007. Um, and then we want the data source to be, to be Bloomberg. Um, so I've got to admit, some of my, a lot of my historical data is actually from Dukas copy, but to make things simple, I've just I've put it all under Bloomberg. Um, and then we want the ticker to be, so again, this is, this is pretty simple stuff. We want the ticker to be that, euro dollar. What fields do we want? We want just a closed field. Um, uh, what frequency do we want? We want intraday. If we want to do daily data, all we need to do is change frequency to daily. If we want to use a different data source like Duca's copy, we just change the data source here. By the way, is this too small or? It's okay. Okay. Um, uh, so what other things do we want? Okay. Um, and then I think I need to put this in as well so it works. <laughs> um, so let's create a data frame and then we fetch the market and then easy data for us. And then oh, we, need, we need to create a market object as well. Uh, and I'm sure I've probably made a mistake, but let's let's actually run this and see whether it works. Or not. Okay. Okay. Where? Fill data by second word, first okay. line. No, uh, st st uh, this is this is a mistake here. So fill data. No, that, that, that's fine. That's fine. I thought it would be more representative if I could uh, do a, uh, oh, I have to say the category is FX. So even though I've done this like millions of times, 
<laughs> okay. Let's let's run that now. Okay. Okay. So there we go. So it's getting some data from Bloomberg, and it's getting my historical data from uh, MongoDB, which is Duca's copy. And there I've printed it. So you, you can see it's, it's actually not too many lines of code to actually get the data. And if we want to plot it, let's actually load our plotting library. So we need to get a chart from Chartify and then style. So let's create a chart object. And let's say we want our engine to be matplotlib. Um, and then let's create a style object as well. So I just want to give it a title. So title equals fx. Um, and then we want to, we can scale it as well. So let's have a scale of one. And then we, we just plot that chart.plot and then put the fx. Let's run that. See, I did a spelling mistake. That's why. It's the first time I've actually done live tweeting, live uh, code in front of an audience. So. <laughs> Probably won't do this again. Don't worry. The, re the rest, the rest of it is all uh, is all scripts anyway. So, okay. and then it's going to plot that. We we can cut that bit later, Paul. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there we go. And then we've got got it here. And then if we wanted to use Plotly, um, it might. I think it might be slower using Plotly. Um, I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. yeah, this this will probably take a while to do that. So presume you set a line a line chart as the default call to each of those. Yeah, like uh, if you want to change the chart, you can you can change. Um, I think it's type. Yeah, chart type. So, I, I, but yeah, typically I end up doing line charts. So that's the, the default one. Um, difficulty is a plot leaves. I'm plotting a couple of million points, it's actually going to be relatively slow. Um, so I should probably plot it daily data. <laughs> so let's actually use daily data. Um, I think that would be a bit nice to show you. Um, and again, you can see that I've just changed one. Um, there we go, it's quicker there. And then you, you've got it live. So the nice thing is you don't need to learn the underlying APIs or anything for Plotly, you just, you just run it. Um, so then if we think of, let's look at some other demos as well. Can we actually speed up Bloomberg downloads as well? So one way that we can try doing this is, um, is using threading. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to run um, a request for a lot of vol data, basically lots of vol data for all these FX pairs, lots of tenors for overnight up to five years, at the money, the riskies, and, and the strangles. And then I'm going to create a market data request object using those. And I've got a keyword here, a category for FX implied vol. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it just single threaded. Um, and then I'm going to run it with four threads and using the multiprocessing library. So there's, there's several different libraries you can use in Python for, for threading. Um, there's the, I think, yeah, just a threading library. But that doesn't actually, that's not true multi-threading because of the global interpreter log. So what you can end up doing instead is using the multiprocessing library, which spawns new Python processes. The problem is there's some overhead in doing that. It's not a lightweight process to do that. Um, so you need to be downloading a lot of tickers to make it worth that additional computation, basically. So it all, this also depends upon the speed of the internet connection. So what you tend to find is that with a very fast internet connection, there's more difference with, with using this. But I suspect here, because I've got Wi-Fi and it's not as fast, it probably won't make as much difference um, in this instance. Um, What's going on now? What's it doing? So it's basically just downloading all this data from, from Bloomberg. Um, How come you don't use a field in this one? Um, because by default, field is closed. Oh. So I've just, just assumed as a, as a default, it's closed. Um, so this will take, this will probably take a while. So we just need to, this to finish. The idea is I'll show you with, with the, the multi-processing library, it should be a lot quicker. <laughs> 
I've learned, I've learned from experience that the, the Wi-Fi is also a big uh, unknown component in it. So. And I've not tried out the Wi-Fi here to see if it works or not. Okay, so that took 80 seconds without any threading. Um, so now this is using the multiprocessor library. Um, so you can already see it seems to be going a lot, a lot quicker, basically. Um, And then I, this, this, I, I hope it should be quicker anyway. <laughs> that, that was the aim. The thing is, it worked very well at home and in level 39 where, where I work. But the, the internet connection is a lot better there. So we're just waiting for that to finish that process, basically. Um, Can you use the actual window fields, like PXLAS or whatever? Yeah, you can use that. So then, but the thing is, what it does, it converts my field close to PX last. But if we wanted to use PX last, we'd, we'd put vendor ticker, vendor fields, right, right. and put PX last if we, if we wanted to. But it, it's actually getting PX last in this instance. Um, <coughs> okay, so there it took 70 seconds. So it's a bit quicker, but I would say that you end up having a lot more speed difference if you. Uh, use it with uh, with a good internet connection. So with with the Wi-Fi, <laughs> it's not the one here is pretty slow actually. So I yeah. So um, another thing I want to show you. This is not necessarily again. This is not necessarily going to be quicker, but I just want to show you because it's it's kind of a fun thing to show you. So I basically have in in Java, I've written um, uh, a class here, and so I've started a basically it's just a, a interface for Java. So I've started it here. And what we can do is, in Python, we, we, we basically create an array list, which is a Java object. And then we can actually call this method here in this entry point. So this is actually going to call Java. Um, again, this should be quicker, but again, it depends upon the, <laughs> the internet connection. Uh, but the main point is just to show you, it's actually fairly easy to call Java in Python. Although it's not traditionally something that people do very often, it's, uh, it's very easy to do. And the way that you do it is you, you need this library, Pi4j. So it's a very easy to use library, and I'd recommend uh, using that. So we started that process, and we can see actually, we can see that the Java process is actually kicking off here. Um, so the idea is that potentially, if you want to have something really heavy computation, one way to speed it up is, for example, using Cython. Um, but then if you want to do something slightly different, and maybe do it in Java, but kick it off in Python, uh, using Pi 4J is a nice way to, to do that potentially. Um, okay, we'll just keep let it run basically over time. Uh, okay, I'm just going to stop that. Uh, and then one thing that we can do is we can also visualize <coughs> using several different pro plotting libraries. I already showed you using Plotly and Matplotlib. Now I want to show you the difference between using VizPy, which is a GPU accelerated library, and using uh, Matplotlib.